Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2021 Mario Virani Annual Memorial Lecture at Houston Methodist. My name is Muad al Mallah. I'm the Director of Cardiovascular Pet, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that you can send your questions by joining the, on the web. Go to paulev.com, enter the Bakey, and respond to the activity and send your question. Or you can join by text by texting the Bakey to 37607, 37607, and text in your message. Today's lecture is named after Dr. Mario Virani, who's, who was a director of nuclear cardiology at the Houston Methodist and the past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Dr. Virani was raised in Brazil before he joined, moved into the United States to train in Cincinnati and Iowa and joined Baylor College of Medicine and Houston Methodist as a nuclear cardiologist and later on the director of nuclear cardiology. He also later on was named as the director of the nuclear cardiology lab until his untimely death in October 20, 2001. Dr. Virani made a lot of contributions to nuclear cardiology. He actually did some of the validation studies for gated SPECT, but his most He's mostly known for his contribution for the application and evaluation of IV adenosine as a pharmacologic stress test, which was used across nuclear labs globally for many years and now moved on to another agent like rigadenosine. He has published more than 200 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and was very involved in all professional societies, but most notably was involved in the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology as a founder, but also as a president of the society. Currently, the most prestigious award of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology is to be named as the lecturer of the uh, Mario Virani lecture. Today's speaker was a Mario Virani lecturer at the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Dr. Kim Williams needs no introduction, but let me just say a few words about his achievements over the years. He's the chief of the division of nuclear cardio uh, chief of division of cardiology at Rush University and also the associate dean for faculty diversity, equity, and inclusion at Rush. He has served on several numerous several and uh, numerous uh, professional societies including being the past president of the American Soci American College of Cardiology and past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology as well as the chairman of the board of directors of the Association of Black Cardiologists he has trained many leaders in the field of nuclear cardiology and cardiology and his current professional focus is on preventive cardiology, specializing in synthesizing data on cardiovascular risk and mortality due to nutrition. He has over 200 publications in nuclear cardiology and other fields, and he was the ASNIC 2018 Mario Virani lecturer and also has several other awards. Today, he's gonna talk to us about cardiovascular risk factors, ethnic disparities, COVID mortality and nutrition. Dr. Williams, we're hoping to have you in person for this honor, but hopefully in the future we'll have you welcome you in person to Houston Methodist. Welcome, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Muaz. And while I have you publicly, I can just embarrass you a little bit talking about how what a wonderful leader you are in multimodality imaging, uh, someone who understands ionizing radiation and the imaging without it. Uh, there are very few people like that, so um, appreciate all your leadership over the years. I'm um, going to share my screen, and I want to talk um, uh, just for a moment uh, about Mario Verani, if I if I can. And it really is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here or anywhere. And it would be great to get back to Houston, uh, but just want to take a moment and talk about what a wonderful leader Mario Verani was. Uh, he actually was 
chairing the um, uh, the guidelines, uh, the, my first attempt at ACCHA guidelines, and uh, really set up the the understanding of how evidence based we need to be. Um, and uh, it's interesting that uh, the 2003 radionuclide imaging guidelines were the last time they, they did uh, any imaging guidelines for ACC and AHA, and they, they knew that they could never overcome uh, what Mario and, and colleagues put together. Uh, Mario really was a mentor to me from far away, um, just uh, participating in society medicine and seeing how he did uh, the academic aspects of never accepting, always questioning, and trying to make sure that the science moved forward uh, for nuclear cardiology. So I appreciate everything that he did, did for me as, as a mentor, and I'm hoping that uh, he'll long be remembered uh, inside his institution across the street and around the world. With that, I want to uh, try to talk about nutrition again. It's very different than when I came down and gave uh, cardiovascular nutrition talk um, for obvious reasons, and that is uh, COVID-19. And you know, you might wonder, you might wonder, what do these have to do with each other? <clears throat> well, it turns out that there is a a large overlap between what I talked about um, in 2018. Um, at the uh, at um, the Varani lecture and uh, when I was at Houston Methodist in the past, well, they, there's a big overlap between COVID-19 illness and cardiovascular mortality, uh, and we'll talk about why. Well, first, I have to put in, it's no fair talking about <clears throat> uh, anything of substance during a pandemic without mentioning the pandemic, and so it'll be interposed or intertwined throughout my talk today that we have understood so much about this disease. And the underlying illness is, uh, is one thing, but how sick people get and whether or not they die really has to do with their underlying conditions, obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, but the heart disease and its risk factors, particularly diabetes and obesity are really huge. Then uh, we saw very much immediately, I'm purposely going back to sort of the uh, late spring of, um, of 2020 when we were first getting wind of all this and seeing that no matter pretty much where you were you were seeing larger numbers of uh, ethnically disparate uh, health care issues coming to the forefront because of the incidence of the disease and the mortality of the disease but it was actually pretty uh, apparent to rush um, where we were collecting a COVID database and analyzing it constantly trying to improve the outcomes, um, that it really wasn't about uh, being African-American or Hispanic that was increasing mortality. It was a lot of the things you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it was the economy. It was uh, inability to uh, not go to your job where you're going to be exposed. It was had a lot to do with uh, nutrition and, and the risk factors that we had. And so there's susceptibility to COVID-19 increasing the incidence. And then the progression really had to do with things like uh, nutrition uh, because it was being, it, it was uh, a manifestation of poor risk factor control. Uh, very similar to our data, they kind of scooped us uh, in New Orleans where we had shown that being black actually at, in our rush database really didn't uh, increase your mortality, actually decreased your mortality if you adjusted for the underlying risk factors. Well, that got published uh, by Dr. Price Haywood uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that, yeah, Blacks have a higher mortality, but if you adjust the model for the baseline characteristics, uh, the mortality is actually less. There's some uh, tiny, not statistically significant, but a tiny protection from being Black, which is not what most people understood. And so, yes, uh, numerically more, but when you look at uh, socioeconomic differences and clinical characteristics, which is what I'm gonna focus on today, um, you saw actually there was less uh, um, uh, mortality. Well, also early on noticing the date of you know, April, 2020, uh, it was very clear that people who, had, who were fit, who had uh, um, better nutrition were doing so much better. And so it's the obesity, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, underlying cardiovascular disease that ends up with a bad outcome from COVID-19. Well, and so that was placed on us uh, on top of an existing pandemic of cardiovascular disease, not just the U.S. Yes, the U.S. is the only 
um, uh, high income country left on the planet where heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. Uh, well, uh, around the world, it's the low and middle income countries. And notice this last uh, note here that over half of all African-American adults have some form of cardiovascular uh, mortality. And please note the 21% higher mortality rate. And so all of, the, all of you who are going to a cardiology grand rounds and getting up and seeing patients every day, thank you for all that you do. Uh, and look at what we've been able to do over the past 40 years. We've decreased cardiovascular mortality about 70%. The problem is that uh, it hasn't been completely um, translated to every population. So you have uh, still more mortality in the African-American community. And then there's this plateau that started in about 2015. And that really has to do with the fact that you can only come up with so many devices. And then at some point, you have to turn your um, efforts to prevention in order to decrease cardiovascular mortality. Because everything that we do with our stents and statins and everything we're really trying to do is essentially mopping up the floor. And at some point, we have to start turning off the faucet. So I don't want to just pretend that this is a United States only disease um, because we have all kinds of numbers indicating bad outcomes around the planet due to poor nutritional habits, not enough fruit, not enough whole grain in this uh, Lancet study uh, showing that uh, 11 million deaths is one thing, but 255 million disability adjusted life years is a big burden to pay uh, because of nutritional factors. And I always, if I think about the world, I kind of have to show this slide. This is the one that I hope everyone recognizes because we can all try to make this better. Wouldn't it be great if we had great life expectancy in the United States and did not have this burden of expenditures, um, which doesn't seem when you compare it with other countries to seem uh, to be worth it. Now for the individual patient whose life is improved after a catastrophic event from mid seventies to late seventies, um, it may seem worth it. Um, but it seems like we really can and should do better. So I would just ask everyone um, in earshot to think about more prevention and see if we can't, uh, as a country, improve things before the Medicare system crashes in 2024 as it's, as it's scheduled to do. So we have to start with our epidemic of uh, obesity. And uh, it's causing uh, the uh, premature death of people in their 40s and their 50s now and, and it's not alone. Uh, along with the obesity comes diabetes, high, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia is part of it too. Now, we're as societies, we are actually addressing it. The American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, I was pleased to be in the room just to hear all these smart people, and they listened to me on nutrition. It was, it was great, but I learned so much from them uh, talking about primary prevention. And uh, the cornerstone, of course, is diet, but we need to address all of the issues and one of the things that we learn is that if we don't, we end up with worse COVID-19. And so the data is out there. It's not just obesity and smoking. It's not like a physical exercise, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. These are the things that protect from COVID-19 illness. We seem to be getting through the, the Delta variant, but there may be another variant. There may be another pandemic. And the, um, hopefully what you'll take away from the talk today is that they're all intercorrelated and that the illnesses that we face as cardiologists are the same ones that put people in trouble. And you can talk about vitamin D, uh, blood sugar, but it's also about uh, body mass index. And so if you are overweight, you're going to have a worse uh, outcome. And vitamin D, um, they, we don't have the data for prevention by taking it, but we, we know that people who are more exercising more, uh, getting out in the Houston sun, they're going to have a higher vitamin D level and they're going to have a better outcome. Our obesity epidemic uh, continues to grow and is definitely associated with um, COVID-19 mortality. Uh, that odds ratio, even for being overweight, 3.68 is uh, a, a difficult um, uh, uh, burden for folks to bear. And for those of you who are interested in the immune aspects, just take a screen capture of this and I won't talk about it too much, but it basically is describing uh, how not only uh, is the, this uh, virus have a lipid bilayer, so it wants the substrate in adipose cells, uh, loves to reproduce itself. 
Um, but there, the effect of obesity on the immune system is one of the major reasons, not just the higher viral loads uh, that we get uh, of why people get so sick. And so that calls into play the idea of nutrition. That is, and we now have publications talking specifically about uh, prevention of obesity and type 2 diabetes with nutrition and with many, many articles at this point, 79 trials, all talking about decreasing the serious risk of COVID-19. So, so, putting, so one of the reasons that we do so poorly with COVID-19 in the United States uh, is the obesity epidemic, not enough uh, um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts. And this data has been out there for a long time. Uh, we've been making recommendations, not just ACC and AHA, but we've been making um, dietary recommendations for the federal government. And that idea of eating two to three cups of vegetables per day, 90% of Americans do not do that. And so that's something we have to look into ourselves. What are the, what's the result? A lot of obesity. Focus, if you will, on the dark um, states that's greater than 35% um, uh, obese. And if you segregate it, since we're talking about ethnic disparities today, um, as, as well as uh, covid Take a look at the number of states where the Caucasian population is more than 35% obese, and then how it triples when you look at the Hispanic population and how it is almost the entire country when you look at the African-American population. And so the, our efforts really have to uh, focus on advertising. We have to, which I'll mention in a bit, we, we have to work on the availability and the content of fast food, particularly in the poor areas. And we have to do get people to make changes. So this is one uh, the Mike Danzinger study from years ago showing, you know, you could argue back and forth, and I will, about vegetarian versus keto. But the anything that keeps people from uh, from having their uh, caloric excess will actually improve people's weights. And so uh, Bree Turner McGreevy's data says that you're way better off doing this with a vegan vegetarian than a uh, diet because it's more sustainable. Uh, and we now know why that is. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, if you look at uh, the ability to lose weight, uh, people are talking about intermittent fasting. The, re the reason that that works, published a, couple, a few months ago, is really because they decrease their caloric intake and not much more than that. How about diabetes and hypertension? We've had data that about nutrition uh, and blood pressure for long periods of time. This is uh, Adventist Health Study, where you take you know, the willing congregants in, in that church, divide them into their um, uh, dietary patterns, and sure enough, the only group, and this is including a lot of Southern California people who are looking a whole lot less obese than the rest of the nation, uh, it turns out that the plant the people who do exclusively plant-based uh, uh, food are the, is the only group that isn't uh, overweight by body mass index greater than more than 25. But also look uh, what happens. You end up with less diabetes and less hypertension. And so uh, does that translate to mortality improvement? It really does by about 30 percent particularly in men, particularly from ischemic heart disease. And so when they published this study, this uh, graph about age incidence of nutrition in their congregation, it, was, it wasn't surprising that as you got older, you became more vegan as you, um, and well, unless you were dying of heart disease or cancer um, in, the non, in the standard uh, American diet population. So the, the vegetarian people live longer and more than that, being 30 pounds lighter means that, you know, they really actually are living more. So it's not just, not just how long you live, but how much life you have in your life. Um, we have data from many places like that, where you actually do a, a vegetarian intervention and fix the blood pressure. And that has made it uh, into our, our guidelines because of the DASH trial. Uh, but even within DASH, cutting your sodium, uh, improving your minerals, improving vegetable intake. Um, uh, but within DASH, if you did one that was very low in fat and cholesterol, which is essentially a vegetarian diet, you got the best result in blood pressure. So that translated into uh, our, uh, our non-pharmacologic interventions. I always have a little chuckle when I see this slide because uh, when we came out in 2017 with the 
uh, new guidelines, and everyone sort of famously heard it, that we dropped the definition of hypertension down to um, 130, both as initiation of, um, of therapy and the target, uh, 130 over 80. Um, and highly controversial. And one of the criticisms was that we were pushing more drugs, that we all had relationships with industry with, with the drug company. First of all, ACCHA doesn't allow any relationships with industry um, if you're going to be on the writing committee. Um, but it also meant that they didn't read the document because we were talking about this. We're talking about physical activity, getting people released from their sofa and uh, doing aerobic dynamic resistance and isometric uh, exercise, limiting alcohol, losing weight, cutting the sodium to less than 1500, increasing the potassium to at least 3,500 milligrams per day, and doing that DASH type of diet that is predominantly vegetarian. And if you do all of that, most of the time, you actually will not need pharmacologic intervention. Um, but some people need it for a brief period of time while they're making these uh, critical adjustments to their lifestyle. Now, talking about diabetes, there are a few things that cardiologists probably aren't aware that uh, of how critical this is for our particular specialty. So I'm showing you a graph, an old graph of you know glucose, refined grains in terms of like white bread, sucrose, fructose, um, and uh, dose-related increases in insulin um, in, induced. And so why is that important to us? Because the hyperinsulinemia uh, not just produces clinical diabetes, but af accelerated atherosclerosis. So we have high triglycerides, we have worsening blood pressure. Um, this uh, does translate into mortality, particularly cardiovascular. This is more, this is JAMA seven years ago saying that the more sugar you eat, the more you die from cardiovascular disease. This was true in the nurses health study at Harvard, uh, where they look at how the nurses were dying uh, after 30 or 40 years in their study. And the number one factor was age. Fine. We understand that. Um, but diabetes was big. Smoking was big. But if you looked in that nutrition corner, it was very clear that if you're eating vegetable fiber, your mortality goes down. You eat uh, uh, a animal product with cholesterol, your mortality goes up. But if you eat a sugar product, it numerically was worse than eating an animal product. This was a very uh, insightful uh, statistical uh, argument that has been reproduced that an unhealthy plant-based diet that has a lot of sugary things, you know, the, you know, vegan beignets and cupcakes and, and the like, is actually more dangerous than eating that hamburger. So we also shouldn't be drinking calories because it has a specific effect. When you drink calories, you will actually induce um, uh, an inflammatory spike uh, in a very brief amount of time, and it's dyslipidemic. And so uh, increasing LDL is something we learned about relatively recently. We knew the HDL would go down and triglyceride would go up. We've been telling patients that forever. Now, but that the uh, glycated, glycated LDL, uh, which is prothrombotic and in numerically increasing LDL is not what we're looking for. Um, I can't talk about um, sugar consumption and without at least mentioning uh, the artificial sweetened data so that everybody knows that when you switch from sugar to an artificial um, uh, sweetener, you're not improving your outcome very much. In this study, it did uh, decrease the increase more, the excess mortality from 31% to 13%, but there are plenty of other studies that say, no, that's not really true. The high consumers actually are worse off than the high consumers of sugar. Um, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but the fact is that neither the sugary drinks or the artificially sweetened beverages are good for you. Uh, dietary patterns does affect our, our uh, prevalence of diabetes. And it's been shown very much that if you have a more plant-based diet, you'll end up uh, with a linear decrease in the frequency of diabetes. Uh, your risk goes down as the plants go up. Uh, how about an intervention? That's true as well. That is, you can actually get a decrease in hemoglobin A1C, uh, just like the blood pressure data that I was showing you. You do a... Um, a go from an omnivorous diet, uh, diet to a low-fat vegan diet, the blood pressure goes down, the weight goes down, and the hemoglobin A1C goes down. And so we've learned so much over the, over, uh, the last few years about diet and diabetes. And, you know, the old mantra that, you know, this was 
it, it was genetic, even type two, and that um, diet didn't matter, uh, that's pretty much out the door. And so I'm going to talk about fats for a moment because uh, there's a lot of controversy here. You might see in Time magazine that butter is back and uh, there are people who uh, push keto diets, which I'll talk specifically about. Um, uh, but I need everyone to understand that there's really good hard evidence and science out there saying that uh, that what a lot of what is said isn't true. And it, we, we have some uh, vegan diet people who say that um, any kind of fat is bad for you. Well, the data actually shows that mortality goes down if you're doing monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, predominantly vegetable fat. Uh, and then you have the keto people saying that you should eat more saturated fat. Well, that in, uh, in a dose related fashion, that increases mortality. We don't worry about trans fats anymore. It's illegal in the United States, Denmark, Sweden, and Canada. Um, but in any time you, you remove saturated fat and substitute it with polyunsaturated or, or monounsaturated, you actually decrease mortality. So our pure trial that every, that gave a, a lot of um, uh, support, so supposedly to people who were pushing fat, saying that fat was better than carbohydrate, really important uh, to recognize that yes, high carbohydrate was associated with more mortality, and that's because it was refined grains, similar to what you saw in, in the nurse's health study. And if you're doing polyunsaturated fat, you rather than carbohydrate, you do much better. So we have a, a nice American Heart Association summary for people who are getting into these arguments. And anytime you replace the saturated fat with unsaturated fat, you're going to improve your LDL and you're going to improve your mortality. I want to switch and talk about cholesterol, but it's hard to talk about cholesterol without inflammation as well, because uh, the two of them are really tied together. And, and you know, you, you've seen the Jupiter trial, Paul Ritker uh, saying how important it is to make sure that both are controlled. Well, it turns out that they are, it's not just for cardiovascular disease, it's actually for COVID-19 lethality. It turns out that the cholesterol molecule becomes a transport um, protein for getting in, uh, into cells. And the more cholesterol you eat, the higher your serum cholesterol is going to be for the majority of humans. And so how much cholesterol are, are people eating? Uh, every art, what they don't realize is necessarily is that there is no cholesterol in plants, uh, at least nanograms maybe. Um, and there are, a, there is one um, uh, product, uh, animal product that doesn't have cholesterol, that's egg whites. The problem is in this, in this country is that people tend to eat egg whites with egg yolks and which has a massive amount of cholesterol per hundred grams. So suppose we intervene and try to remove that cholesterol, increase the fiber, uh, do a diet uh, in a scientific fashion. One of the first, um, uh, one of many that was published, but a randomized control trial uh, was put up in JAMA years ago, a portfolio diet, plant sterols, viscous fibers, soy protein, almonds. And what it showed is that the diet was just as good as a statin, albeit a low dose statin. Uh, at lowering the LDL and a little bit better than the statin to early on decrease uh, C-reactor protein. And so we have really good randomized trial evidence that this should work. We've, that has continued, particularly talking about the uh, anti-inflammatory effects of a plant-based diet. Uh, this was nice to see the American Heart Association admit that the American Heart Association diet uh, of the past, before we came out with our new guidelines, um, did not actually lower um, inflammation we knew it wouldn't uh, lower cholesterol because there were animal products in it, but the uh, vegan diet does lower C-reactive protein shown completely independently from um, University of Toronto's uh, portfolio diet. We have a large amount of data in that regard showing that plant-based intervention uh, and even, some of them uh, even had some animal products, but lowering it, be pesco vegetarian, but predominantly the vegan diets actually lower cholesterol substantially. Now, I'm going to switch over from the components to talk about um, dietary patterns for a moment. And that is because we really have a massive amount of data um, on how people are eating and whether it makes them die. And so one that you should be aware of not too far from you is the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And talking, and that's the REGARD study. And the shocking curve is what they published a few years ago, saying that the Southern diet, and that's a politically correct way of saying, you know, what we were eating on the South side of Chicago, Southern, um, meaning soul food, uh, where uh, the African-American population tends to 
uh, eat, you know, not just chicken, but fried chicken, um, putting meat um, in the greens and sweetened beverages and um, that, that sort of approach with high saturated fat, a lot of um, refined grains and sugar ends up with an increase in mortality and it's cardiovascular, it's renal and it's cerebrovascular as well. And something that we should be able to talk people into doing a whole lot better. We also have learned a lot. This is a JAMA publication um, uh, uh, from NHANES that really talked about the, what makes people die and eating a lot of sodium. So this changed our guidelines completely. Uh, we should be doing more nuts and seeds. Um, uh, the, I always chuckle about the high processed meat. Well, what was high? Any, ever, any <laughs> greater than zero. And the same thing was true of, of sugar sweetened beverages. We all should be doing much more in the way of uh, fruits and vegetables. And this omega-3 fats, well, that's really just what I call a substitutionary benefit. If you get rid of the red meat and put white meat in there, your mortality goes down. Not as good as vegetables, perhaps, but it's better than, than eating red meat. Um, and for those who, uh, who have adopted a plant-based diet, last time I was in Houston um, with Baxter Montgomery um, at his uh, wellness center giving a lecture, I ran around looking for you know, vegan places and they're on my happy cow app. And it turns out there are quite a number of them, but a lot of the vegan food was the stuff that you would enjoy. Uh, it was, you know, the potatoes were fried, the, there were juices and the like. Um, if you have that kind of a less healthy plant-based diet, okay, it turns out, as, as I mentioned, um, that the mortality, the, cardi the coronary heart disease curve uh, per dose actually is higher than what you would get with animal products. And so it's something that uh, the plant-based community, animal rights, uh, worried about global warming, those are important, uh, particularly as you're approaching your hurricane season, you'd like it to be a little more gentle, get our plan, planet fixed. Yes, uh, I'd like to say that our plant-based, uh, our unhealthy plant-based diet is really good for the planet, but it's not good for humans. Um, back to the pure trial on this particular topic, um, because Salim Youssef, I sort of hassled him mercilessly about the first publication saying, don't you think that increase in mortality with, with uh, carbohydrates is because it was refined grains? Uh, and they went back and guess what? They published it. It's really about refined grains, not uh, carbohydrates as such is high intake of refined grains. That is, if you take the grain and you eat it and you've got carbohydrate in the uh, context of its fiber, you don't increase the mortality. And if, if you're not able to do that, it goes badly. And so um, this is actually, for those of you who, uh, who are knowledgeable in this area and have looked into it and you say, hey, this data about vegan diet and cardiovascular disease is highly variable. This is why it's highly variable because there are plenty of things that are vegan that are not healthy uh, if you're frying them or you're taking away the fiber. And so um, you have this data all over the place. Yes, it hurts, it helps your carotids. Um, oh, but it increases stroke, uh, cardi uh, recurrent cardiovascular disease events somewhere between no improvement to a massive amount of improvement. And that's because all of the vegan diets are completely different. And so that finally was published in neurology literature a few months ago, thankfully, uh, just coming out and saying it. That is, their risk of having that uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke is really dependent on how good your diet is. And so the plant-based diet that uh, has a high quality, lower stroke, bad quality, increases stroke. I want to talk about the ketogenic diet and, and that the reason to do that. Oops. Okay. The reason to, to do that here is that we are struggling uh, with our obesity epidemic, as I showed you, it's, a, it's around the country. And this is one answer that is fairly popular. People are eating things that they love, a lot of bacon, a lot of grease, and um, they're enjoying it and feeling like they are actually benefiting from it. Well, uh, weight-wise, that is absolutely true. Yeah, okay, there we go. All right, and so, and there's only one problem, and that is mortality. It turns out that a, a low carbohydrate, high protein, high fat diet can result in weight loss, uh, but it decreases uh, um, survival, increased mortality 22% uh, in, uh, from that one study. This one from Japan, similarly, uh, they came up 
with more like a uh, 31% when they added their data to others, uh, 31% increase in mortality. Probably the most famous because it was so large from the ERIC trial, uh, and it was so well analyzed. Looking at the, um, was the Seidelman article in Lancet Public Health uh, a couple of years ago saying that if you did it with animal products, a keto diet or low carb diet with animal products, it increases your mortality. Uh, if you did it with plants, uh, nuts, uh, vegetables, nut butters, whole grain breads, that lowered your mortality. And both were 18%, 18% increase in death, 18% decrease in death if you did it in plants. And so, uh, but, you know, so how do you explain all the differences and how much people die? It really depends on how low the carbohydrate level was. And so you can get these wide numbers in every study, depending on uh, what kind of how, how low carbohydrate and how keto inducing uh, it is. Uh, big warning for all of us in cardiology, you'll occasionally see someone coming in after myocardial infarction. Uh, and if they are doing a uh, low carb diet, it's a 53% increase in mortality. So what's going on with that? Well, it's really simple. It's uh, lipids and, and inflammation. And so uh, this study really brought it out. If we can uh, avoid that, the increase in cholesterol is not tolerable to everyone. Um, and you, you get a lot of endocrine changes when you do this. But the most important uh, in terms of mortality is not letting the, in, the LDL cholesterol go up substantially. Um, this is a, a nice review of it in the uh, Journal of Clinical Lipidology, the National Lipid Association, talking about how wonderful it is for weight loss, but that increase in the LDL cholesterol is not going to be good despite the A1C going down and the blood pressure going down. So what's wrong with that diet? Well, it's got a lot of fat, the saturated fat, which, which we talked about, but people actually eat food, not just fat, right? And so they're eating eggs that has a high amount of cholesterol in it. And, the, and despite what you see in the marketing, the, the data is very clear. The more eggs you eat, the more you die. And um, every additional half an egg consumed per day uh, is associated with more cardiovascular events. Um, people said that, no, that study doesn't count. Um, a, it's from Northwestern and there are competitors. And it's just, just teasing. Um, they, um, they, it was well done. Don Lloyd-Jones, incoming president of the American Heart Association, um, but they were saying that it, it's the United States population. Um, but when it was analyzed elsewhere, same thing. And it was a, about a, a half an egg per day, higher cause, all cause mortality, cancer and cardiovascular disease. Well, how about uh, in Italy, where they don't perhaps mistreat the eggs as, as the uh, as the story went? Well, it turns out that the same thing was true. Four eggs per week, that's just about a half an egg per day. And it's so it, it is very clear that uh, eggs increase mortality. Well, the rest of it is red meat. And so uh, red meat has been long shown to increase mortality. Um, you know, red meat kills, processed red meat kills faster. And data is from multiple studies. Uh, that was the Harvard data showing a linear increase for people who say anything in moderation. Well, the biggest increase in mortality is between zero and one um, uh, serving per day. And it's uh, coronary heart disease uh, in, in men. Uh, what's the best way to get to lower the incidence is to take the red meat out and substitute it with just about anything. Fish didn't do very well in this particular study uh, analysis, but everything else did, uh, whether it was poultry, dairy, uh, nuts. Uh, the best, of course, was soy. And, and, you know, getting a 33% decrease in uh, the risk of coronary disease. I have to uh, give special mention to the Mediterranean diet, because this is one of the things that uh, when I was doing my reviews of um, faculty uh, uh, notes, the practice, uh, practice evaluation that the chief has to do, uh, I saw a lot of recommendations for Mediterranean diet, and I just want to clarify, and I did to my faculty uh, who were putting that in there, that they were listening to U.S. News and World Report uh, saying that it's the number one diet for overall. But this was based, you know, when you look at the U.S. News and World Report, they were talking about the 2018 republication of the uh, uh, random, randomization problem corrected um, Predimet trial, New England Journal of Medicine. And it got a lot of press. And everyone actually shows this upper left-hand corner. 
shows a 30% decrease in heart attack, stroke, and death. But if you read the rest of the paper, you, first of all, uh, right there on the, the front uh, figure one, uh, panel B said there was no change in mortality. But if you blow up the data, it actually is very clear that that combined endpoint was driven by a decrease in stroke. Now, we have such an amazing stroke unit, and they're always overwhelmed at Rush. Uh, be great to have a 30% decrease in stroke rate and make life a little more tolerable. But for cardiology, there was no improvement in heart attack, no improvement in death from cardiovascular causes. And in fact, there was no improvement in death from any cause. So for cardiology, this is not a diet that we should push. Now, they're friends of mine. I, you know, hassled them mercilessly about why didn't you do a vegan um, intervention? And they said, well, we kind of did. And they published it. That is, what they were saying is that everyone should be doing a pro-vegetarian type of Mediterranean diet. And so they actually analyzed their data and it was striking. It wasn't absent mortality benefit. This was a striking mortality benefit. If you were in the top quintile or even the next to top quintile in, um, in vegetable consumption, uh, rather than not just switching from red meat to poultry, but using a lot of vegetables, you had like a 42% decrease in mortality. So the, so if we were going to recommend a Mediterranean diet, it should be a, what they're, you know, uh, sort of uh, cleverly calling the vegetarian diet. So what's the problem? And that is that all animals increase mortality. And so this is, uh, please take a look at this title for a moment. Um, you know, you'll notice that this is the Harvard group again, Nurses Health, Health Professional Follow-Up. Um, one thing that I always have to point out, you have to have a risk factor to be in this analysis. Uh, but the analysis is very clear that if you had any risk factors, you had an increase in mortality with every animal product. And that, uh, but there's a rank order. Poultry and fish are way better than dairy. They, dairy better than red meat, red meat better than eggs and eggs better than processed red meat, bacon, ham, uh, hot dogs, sausage and the like. And so this data uh, from a few weeks ago isn't surprising. Uh, it's an analysis that from University of Michigan saying that don't eat hot dogs. Uh, because they are very, very dangerous. I know there's a lot of World Series people eating a lot of hot dogs. And so um, I, uh, hopefully the uh, series will come out in your favor. But um, if you could get people to do something else other than hot dogs at baseball games, it'd be great. Okay. This is not a, a, a mistake. This is JAMA, three years after the, uh, the Harvard group. Same title, same idea. Substitute 3% of your um, vegetable protein, I'm sorry, vegetable protein for animal protein and see what happens. And the data was almost identical. Um, for There was a, a little strangeness in terms of uh, in the Japanese cohort uh, from which this was derived, where dairy was a little bit of protective all cause, but increased cardiovascular mortality. Um, so red meat was clearly the one that reached statistical significance, um, but again, completely different population. All animal products increase mortality. And they published it a third time. So you, you're probably saying, how, what journal editors would use the same title three times? Well, um, I think they really wanted to get the point across that this is uh, not uh, Nurses Health or Japanese. This is the NIH AARP study, and it was very clear that and they, they did the same type of analysis, 3% substitution, um, but they analyzed it slightly differently rather than just the uh, forest plot that you saw. Uh, you're looking at overall mortality, cardiovascular disease, uh, to look at the red meat data very clearly, p-values uh, that are highly significant, that um, it hurts people's hearts and brains. Uh, same thing with egg protein, no question about it. Okay, so where should you get your protein? Well, uh, there's data on that. Uh, you could use uh, vegetarian protein, fish pro fat protein, just about any protein that you do is going to decrease your mortality compared to red meat, as I've shown you in other studies, uh, and vegetarians have the lowest uh, cardiovascular disease incidence. So does that mean you should be eating the, the famous Larson to food beast? Well, probably not, <laughs> because there's plenty of protein uh, in vegetable substances, People just don't realize that beef and peanuts have the same amount of protein, that quinoa is more than egg whites, and soybeans, uh, lentils, and chickpeas are actually greater than any animal product per 100 grams. 
But what they don't have is this. And so um, I'm going to spend a, a bit of time uh, talking about this, but I, I want you to please, if you're not familiar with this story, jot these four letters down and uh, do put it in your search engine with a warning that by the time you're done looking at TMAO, you will be a vegan. Well, and what is it about? It turns out trimethylamine in oxide was the first time I ever heard of the microbiome, microbiota, this gut flora, uh, and how they influence disease, heart attack and stroke and death, using trimethylamine, the development of trimethylamine, and then the hepatic metabolism to trimethylamine in oxide. And this data has gotten a lot more complicated since that first publication in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and any animal product that you eat that particularly red meat um, will increase, will change the gut microbiota. When you're eating, there's no pardon my way of saying, but there's no other way to say it. When you're eating uh, decaying flesh, it has a, a microbiome within itself that you ingest, and it changes the species of the, um, of the GI tract. That, that microbiome that is destructive um, will actually uh, result in more trimethylamine in oxide, which uh, isn't, isn't just cardiovascular disease. It turns out it's, heart, um, it's chronic kidney disease as well. And so we see data from them, from their group, uh, showing that the highest quintile has the highest myocardial function, stroke and death rate, that platelet aggregation is enhanced by a high level of TMAO. So a meat eater uh, taking aspirin has platelet aggregation similar to a vegan um, with a vegan level of uh, very low uh, trimethylamine in oxide. Uh, and so, it's something to remember when we're trying to deal with cardiovascular disease. Uh, we have really good data now talking about meat consumption and risk of ischemic heart disease um, because of uh, our uh, red meat and processed red meat. And it makes perfect sense when you think about it from the gut hypothesis. This is the heart failure data showing that uh, that, that kind of diet uh, really does that increases TMAO also is associated with heart failure. We've had this data now for a while. This is uh, Alicia Wolt's study uh, published years ago talking about processed versus unprocessed meat and heart failure, uh, increasing mortality by 243%. Um, and so, and so that is a call to take every person who has heart failure, get rid of their TMAO by getting rid of the red meat. Now, we actually have uh, uh, an in intervention study or an analysis by Kyla Lara that says the same thing, that if, you're, if you have a heart failure patient and you do a follow-up and you get them to do a plant-based diet, you end up with about a 40% decrease in heart failure uh, bad outcomes. Now, the TMAO story continues to um, fascinate us, and I hope everybody is looking at it because uh, it turns out that it's associated with more diabetes, which then, of course, is going to relate to cardiovascular disease. So what's the real message here? It's about the microbiome. It turns out that um, uh, everyone, no pun intended, but pun's always intended, everyone should have the guts to go vegan. It turns out that the microbiome is um, resulting in all of the classic risk factors, the increase in TMAO uh, with the data that I've shown you. And it, what we didn't know about it, the microbiome until recently uh, is that most of us are not human, mostly. Uh, human cells are only about 43% of the body's total cell count. Um, and that the microbiome controls the immune system, the digestion, and it actually creates toxins or eliminates toxins, creates inflammation or eliminates inflammation. And uh, I'm talking cardiology here, but we really should be talking neurology, autism, um, uh, yeah, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. And so this TMAO plays a critical um, uh, role and the diet plays a, a critical role in populating the GI tract's microbiome. And if you take a person and you feed them uh, fake meat, the vegetable meat, their TMAO level goes down or stays low. If you feed them red meat, it goes up. If you change it to white meat, it goes down. And so, the, so it's time to, of course, relate that to COVID-19. And this was published a, a few months ago. Everyone should be aware uh, that, you know, the word on the street is that vegans don't die of COVID. Well, that, I'm sure that's not 100% true, but it appar apparently 
in large populations, those of us who know a lot of them, nobody's seen a vegan die of COVID. It, it must have happened. It just it has to be very, very rare. And the data is actually very clear that the cytokine storm inflammatory markers are coming from the microbiome. And so every all of the stuff pre- producing hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, and COVID uh, bad outcomes. Uh, and so what we need to do is get everybody through the rest of both pandemics to change to a vegetarian vegan diet, to change the microbiota, get, get more bacteroides species, which actually works pretty well. Um, and this can happen in as little as four days, but it may take up to uh, four weeks to change the microbiome completely. Um, and so we have this data published a few weeks ago that everyone should see showing that if you are ve- vegan, um, you will end up, uh, and even pesco vegetarian, you will end up with a much better microbiome and much better um, uh, outcome from COVID. This is this wasn't mortality. This was actually looking at severity of illness, moderate to severe uh, COVID. It turns out the plant-based diet is a 72, 73% protection. And so odds ratio of uh, uh, 0.27. And, and if you were doing the, the uh, low carb, high protein diet, that increased the odds of a bad outcome. Um, so please, no keto diets, particularly during COVID. I, so I, with the time limited, I'm just going to show you snippets of the risk factors in the microbiome. Turns out the hypertension really is due to uh, the microbiome. Sure, there's some genetic and environmental factors, but it has to do with metabolism um, and the biochemistry that's happening within the gut. Uh, it turns out that cholesterol, you might not have heard of the ISMA gene. I certainly hadn't before this data started coming out. It turned it, who There's a reason that no one has heard of caprostanol. It's because it doesn't hurt anybody. And if you have a good bacteria in your GI tract, you change your cholesterol to caprostanol, it gets excreted and not in the, ending up in plaque. How about diabetes? It turns out that type 2 diabetes is is uniquely associated with the bad bacteria that you get when you're eating animal products. Um, And so there's wonderful amounts of data. You can see the bad bacteria in red, good bacteria that are protective against diabetes and in blue. These are the ones you want in your GI tract, not the red ones. How about obesity? Uh, Did you know that fecal transplant of an obese person to a, a thin person can make them obese and vice versa? And it has to do with the fact that unbeknownst to us, obesity was um, really being controlled by the gut microbiome and what kind of fermentation happens. And um, this, the uh, bacterial lipopolysaccharide uh, absorption. um, And it turns out that uh, this really is uh, gut permeability. This really is an opportunity for us to use a a very, very simple method uh, whether it's uh, changing your diet or doing everything you can to change the microbiome. Can't talk about this stuff without uh, adding cardiorenal disease because we see so many people um, who are suffering from chronic kidney disease. They don't die of kidney disease, they die of heart disease. And so the animal protein relation to chronic kidney disease is something that's come on recently in the past couple of years. A lot of our nephrology colleagues are not aware of it, that animal protein is what's causing chronic kidney disease in our, in our population, particularly African-Americans. And when you do plant protein, you decrease this substantially. So inverse relationship between plant protein and chronic kidney disease. Uh, red uh, end-stage renal disease, uniquely associated with intake of red meat. We still see our nephrology um, um, nutritionists telling my patients uh, to eat more red meat. Um, They're just not aware of this data yet, but I know it's recent, but hopefully everyone will understand that red meat causes kidney disease associated with it. And when you uh, restrict it, you can make things a whole lot better. And that's due to microbiome and uh, and TMAO, um, not just the development of disease, but mortality within the disease. And so hopefully everyone will understand that they need to change the diet, more plant-based nutrition, the chronic kidney disease and the heart failure and the coronary disease population to improve survival. So uh, we've had this data for a while. We didn't have the kidney. We didn't have the mechanism that all of these risk factors were happening because of particularly processed red red meat. There are some mechanisms that I didn't talk about today. One that I am gonna sort of end up with is the um, heme iron story. 
that that is very clear that if you're eating iron from animals, you actually increase mortality uh, because it increases reactive oxygen species and instability of plaques. Uh, you should be getting your your um, uh, iron from vegetable sources. So in closing, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a study that we did to try to emphasize our nutrition uh, recommendations from the ACC 2019 prevention guidelines, where we said, please do more vegetables and fruits. Please get rid of the um, uh, saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, processed meat, refined carbohydrates, um, sweetened beverages. And uh, we actually uh, have a struggle with this because as we published a few days ago, the mar what's being marketed to people is extremely unhealthy. And if, our, if we can't change our television commercials, we're gonna continue to have this problem. We did a nutrition intervention though, using the ACC guidelines um, in a church on the South side of Chicago, did it for Lent so that the adherence would be good, uh, five weeks of vegetarian food, and this is what happened. Insulin levels dropped, TMAO levels dropped, all of the risk factors improved dramatically. When we plug the, the formula into um, the, this at-risk population uh, with fairly high ACCAHA risk calculator scores, um, uh, with, when you included the weight loss and everything that improved, um, we ended up with eliminating about 19% of that 10-year uh, risk um, that, that we could calculate. Uh, obviously, they would need to sustain it for the 10 years to get that benefit. Uh, but it was there. So we have a nice cookbook out there. And uh, our, the Houston native uh, Baxter Montgomery is uh, was I, I was the co-author. It was my idea, but he did all the work um, because he's the guy who knows all the recipes. It's on the ABC website. And so uh, I would say, you know, if I opening it up to questions that we have actually are living in a dual pandemic, it's uh, a lot of it is exercise and lifestyle choices. Um, we have good data that people should be doing nutrition for cardiovascular disease and COVID and chronic kidney disease um, uh, with plants. And it has to do primarily with the microbiome, uh, which we just didn't understand in the past. And so we really need to be advocating for risk factor reduction, community efforts wherever we can to reduce the mortality and morbidity associated with these nutritional related illnesses. And with that, I'm opening it up for questions. I think I have a couple minutes left. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for a great uh, talk and overview. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can send your questions by going to polyv.com and enter Tibeki and enter your question, or you can text Tibeki to 37607. So we have a few questions, Dr. Williams, and I'll start with sure. one. I mean, this topic is also... Um, at that, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation going on about this topic. I mean, from either side, from the vegetarian side and also from the diet yes. side. And uh, we heard a lot of information on social media. How can the medical community in general kind of combat some of these misinformation campaigns that sometimes could hurt our patients, uh, and especially cardiovascular patients? I agree completely, Malaz. This is really, um, uh, it's high stakes. Uh, there's a lot of money involved uh, with people pushing for particular diets and products. There's a lot of um, advertising dollars, which we showed in that study we published a few days ago. But the, the when we're trying to change someone's diet, you know, it's like we're attacking their family, sometimes their church and, and their culture. But um, the only thing that we can do is keep talking about it. We go and we do community uh, projects, uh, not just in the churches, but community groups, trying to in, inter interact with um, the community and get them to understand the principles in our guidelines. Uh, but, you know, I, we're not alone. I mean, ACCHA guidelines, how are they adopted? How can we get them adopted faster? Uh, whether it's dual antiplatelet therapy. I mean, I, the people coming to me uh, taking dual antiplatelet therapy for three years now um, and just putting up with their nosebleed. Well, we had DAP guidelines in 2017. So I, I'm, the, my, my point is that you're, you're asking the critical question for ACCAHA. That is, how can we do better? And I think the tools that you talked about is how we combat it. We actually have to use the social media. We have to uh, try to get the press out. 
you know, everyone heard about not taking aspirin, by the way. Hey, we said that in 2019. That was part of our of our ACCHA primary prevention. Hashtag rethink aspirin. But, you know, when the USPTF does it, then it got more press. So we have to be more effective in the media. Um, and I, I think that's the only solution. All right. So and we know that there is a lot of data coming out from imaging looking at the impact of inflammation and the acceleration of inflammation, uh, especially with pericoronary fat attenuation and others. Is there any data looking at the uh, sugar impacting inflammation, whether systemic or locally around the coronaries? So I don't know that there's anything local, not like the EAT, the epicardial adipose tissue data. And I, this is something that I hope everyone heard what you just talked about, uh, because uh, a lot of our colleagues who are interpreting CTs, just a non-contrast CT of the chest, you have that risk right there, uh, and they're not really reporting it. So I, I'm, that's another thing that should be in the guidelines and get it out there. Um, but I, I don't know that anyone has ever looked at like the data that, that I was showing saying that you got a spike within 30 minutes of, uh, of inflammation from a sugar sweetened beverage. I don't know that anyone's ever looked at an imaging component for people who were doing a lot of it versus those who were not. Uh, I think that would be a, a very interesting study to do. I want to finish up with like more of a general prevention question. I mean, you focused on diet today, but there are also a lot of other uncontrolled risk factors. I mean, smoking is still very common among minorities and uh, unfortunately many people who have multiple other comorbidities. And how can we at least to combat any re-rise in the uh, smoking, especially with the vaping but pandemic that's happening. Not pandemic, but a lot of adoption and, again, a lot of money involved in that. I'm trying to get these people uh, back to vaping and sometimes bridge to smoking rather than a bridge out of smoking. I agree completely, and that was one of the more... Uh, difficult areas of our, you know, the seven sections of our 2019 ACC prevention guidelines is that we're talking about the effectiveness of drugs. But what I'd like to talk about with, um, with smoking is the data from the like 1990s that said that it's you, Dr. Muaz <laughs> Amala, it's you talking to the patient and emphasizing how important it is and how they can actually improve their outcome of their disease. That, um, that study showed that if a person has a heart attack, they're in the CCU and the cardiologist walks in and says, you have to stop smoking. That was a 47% uh, absence of cigarettes at one year. None of the pills that we talk about in the guidelines, none of the biofeedback, any of the other methods, get them anywhere close to 47%. So I'm hoping that everyone is hearing you and understanding how important the role of the physician is in talking to patients and counseling them uh, for not just cigarette smoking, but nutrition um, and exercise. The things that are going to make people healthy, monitoring their blood pressure, knowing what their cholesterol is, monitoring their blood sugar if they're diabetic or pre-diabetic. All of these uh, so-called uh, life um, simple seven uh, principles from the American Heart Association are things that we should have in every one of our clinic notes and seeing if that um, will help people getting them to understand uh, how important these things are. All right. I think we're a little bit over time, and I would like to thank you for a great lecture for the 2021 Mario Virani Memorial Lecture. I appreciate you being here, and hopefully we'll welcome you in person to Houston, too. Thank it you. It certainly was my pleasure, and what an honor. Thank you. Thank you.